Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Huda. I'm your host, Jumil Rashid. And I have with me today Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah Sheikh for being with us today. Wa Okay, today's episode uh, is following the last episode actually. We're going to go through some of your email questions. We've got quite a lot pending here, so please be patient with us. We want to get through our questions from our brothers and sisters. If you want to send an email, please send it to ask, ASK at Huda, H U D A. TV. Sheikh, let's start off with a question from the brother Asim from the Bahamas. Um, he's asking uh, about a question regarding his mother who's working in a bank and which deals with interest. He says, uh, how do I go about advising her that this is haram? Uh, fortunately, we have no other person in the house who's going to help us with our finances, only my mother. Um, what do we do in this scenario, Sheikh? الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Praise be to Allah. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show Him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. It is very unfortunate. to hear uh, that many Muslims are working their entire life and providing for their family members from unlawful sources. Uh, while knowing that the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah does not accept the prayers, the dua and the supplication of a person who earns from haram, who feeds himself and wears from unlawful sources. As once Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas Asked, Nabi sallallahu, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, Allah an yaj'alani mustajab ad-da'wah. Ask Allah to make my dua always accepted. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered him saying, Ya Sa'ad, atib mat'amaka takun mustajab ad-da'wah. Make sure you eat from lawful uh, earning. Your dua will be accepted, your prayer will be accepted. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَ طَيِّبُ لَا يَقْبَلُ إِلَّا طَيِّبًا Allah is indeed very good and He only accepts that which is good. So He does not accept that charity which has been given uh, through earning an unlawful source, uh, uh, earning. Either through gambling or Uh, pain or collecting interest or being a teller in a bank that pays and collects interest because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الرِّبَى آكِلَهُ وَمُؤْكِلَهُ وَكَاتِبَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهِ and this is a very serious warning the curse or a la'an means to be expelled from Allah's mercy to be deprived from his rahmah He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the sound hadith, may Allah curse the one who pays interest and the one who charges interest. Uh, the, one <coughs> the teller, the one who writes this contract between uh, uh, the one who pays and the one who charges, and even the witnesses. So everyone who is related directly or indirectly to such invalid business contract and business transaction, is included in the threat, la'an Allah. Many people right away say, I don't have any other source of income, I don't have any other means. This is the easiest claim that everyone can do as a weak believer. But the strong believer would put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would work on finding another alternative. In Allah huwa razzaq al-mateen. The problem is we don't even try. We say, this is it, this is what I can do, and I cannot, if I leave this job, what if they kick you out, or if they fire you? What are they going to do? You're going to start looking. What if this bank is shut down and out of business? 
What, what, what if you die yourself? Who's going to provide for your family? All these questions and question marks uh, should have answers, very clear answers in your mind. And when you realize that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam promised the one who uh, works hard by putting his trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala first, trust in him that Allah is the only provider. Then seeking the provision from lawful sources, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would certainly provide for him as exactly he provides for birds which fly early morning looking for their daily provision, hand to mouth with empty stomachs and they return home while their stomachs are full because of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for them. Basically, what you need to work on with your mother is the concept of the true tawakkul, the true tawakkul, the way we should put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And verifying all the frustrations and finding answers for the fake questions that a shaitan raises in our mind that uh, if I don't work in this, we're going to die. No, you're not going to die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided and decreed for you a certain provision. Well, unfortunately, you hasted to get this provision from haram. If you don't get it from haram, you will get it from halal. So trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to find alternative. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide for all of us from sources which he is pleased with. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Uh, the brother had a second question about his mother. It's regarding going to work by herself. He says that, you know, my mother drops us off at the school, me and my sister. Then she goes to the hospital sometimes and she goes to work by herself. Uh, sometimes she returns with her husband from work. Um, going to work and back, is this seen as traveling, he's asking really? Can she go alone by herself? We said it is permissible for a woman to work generally whenever it's needed. Uh, sometimes it becomes incumbent on her to provide for herself and mm. uh, those who are under her guardianship. If she is a guardian for She's the, the only one he says that's working. Actually. But she said the husband, he, uh, he mentioned that she returns home. He goes to pick her up and brings her back home sometimes. Okay. We need to discuss two things. The first is that the financial responsibility uh, providing for the family is the task of the man. And that is the meaning of Men are protectives and guardians for women. Mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, بِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Among the reasons why Allah made men protectives and guardians for women is that they provide for them. They work, they earn, they provide for uh, their women. Uh, so the financial responsibility at home is totally the man's. Sometimes a man is disabled or is laid off and doesn't have a job. That happens and we've seen that in the West. And the woman is working and she's working in a lawful field. She said that she's a physician. And we discussed before that uh, women are needed as physicians we have a hard time finding a female physician to treat my wife and your wife. So if this is her field, it's permissible and it's recommended with a condition that they should not transgress on her tasks and duties as a wife, as a mother, as a house engineer. This is the most important task. Also, if she spends the night out working and this is needed because of emergency and so on, uh, she should be working in a field which is secure, should not... Uh, be alone, should not be alone with a man in private room, whether she's a physician or anything else. Because in Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, مَجْتَمَعَ رَجُلٌ وَمْرَأَةٌ إِلَّا كَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ ثَالِثُهُمَا That always happens. Whenever there is a private meeting and it gathers only a man and a woman, then the third, they're not alone. The third is a shaytan. Even if he's a sheikh and she's a scholar, mm -hmm. even if she's a physician and he's a patient. And to get out of this, it's very simple. If there's a clinic in a public place and there is a nurse that somebody who is present during this uh, uh, diagnosis or uh, that she's been seen by others, she's not alone with somebody who's not her male mahram. In the same. This is not only uh, for a physician, this is for every single woman. We send our daughters to uh, private tutors or we invite a private tutor 
at one place and he sits with the girl alone behind closed doors. This is haram. So this is a general ruling should be applied in every similar condition. So as far as your mother's job, uh, it is permissible and lawful, alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah, and her earning is lawful as well. Uh, and as long as she does not travel out of the city or out of the town alone without mahram, then going back and forth to job and to the hospital, as long as it is safe, is permissible as well. And Allah knows. Um, Sister Ferdosa sent in a question uh, about her friend. She said, my friend recently married a man, but she hid this marriage from her parents. Um, she did this because she was afraid that her parents won't accept this person, even though she says this person is a committed practicing Muslim. Um, this friend of hers doesn't live in the same country as her parents, uh, but she's in contact with them. She's in telephone conversations and so forth. Um, she wants to know, is this marriage valid for my friend? I tried to convince her to tell her parents, she says. Um, she won't listen and uh, she won't inform her parents until she hears some sound Islamic proof that what her relationship with this person uh, is invalid or valid to the contrary. The vast majority of the Muslim jurists have used the reference of Hadith wa Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, in which the Prophet sallallahu says, any woman who gives herself in marriage without the permission and the consent of her wali, فَنِكَاحُهَا بَاطِلْ In this marriage, her marriage is invalid. And accordingly, this relationship between her and this man whom she married to without her guardian's permission is adultery. SubhanAllah. Is an illegitimate relationship. This is conditioned on the approval of the wali. And this is a sincere advice to all the girls who plan to get married simply because we live in a free society and I can decide for myself. And some people will deceive them and say, yeah, Imam Abu Hanifa said it's okay for a woman to give herself in marriage. What you don't know is, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, is the most strict Imam when it comes to the concept of Al-Kafa'ah. Hmm. Yani you don't just give yourself in marriage to anyone. Well, he gives the father the power of invalidating and voiding this marriage if the girl gives herself in marriage to somebody whom he does not approve because he's not fit. And he considers very, very strict conditions in the uh, term and the concept of al kafa and qualifications. That the family lineage, the language, the prestige of the family, wealth, so many factors which even other uh, fuqaha did not consider. So basically, you should never, dear sisters, dear teenagers, you should never, ever, Think about it. As long as your guardian is a righteous man and he does not prohibit you from marrying because he wants you to stay at home and he doesn't want to give you in marriage to a righteous man or to a religious person because he is poor or whatever, each case will be handled separately because his guardianship is not for granted. We we'll take it to her authority and his guardianship could be withdrawn and confiscated from the person if he is not fit, if he is not qualified to be responsible for the girl, would be taken to the grandfather, would be taken to the brother, would be taken to the uncles, would be taken to the local imam, would be given to the sultan or the, uh, uh, the, you know, the governor, so that everyone would preserve their rights and no one would transgress against the other's rights. The right in marriage for the guardian is his consent is considered. No woman, nor a girl, whether first time to get married, or pre-married before, divorced, or a mm -hmm. widow, should mm -hmm. ever give herself in marriage without the approval and the consent of her wali. Now there's a, a, another question attached to this, and this is where the, the twist comes. The sister says, now the sister um, is pregnant, she has a child uh, on the way. And um, what's her situation here now, considering what you just said now? The situation, we don't deal with this as adultery in a sense that we don't, even if in a Muslim state, we don't punish them the punishment of adultery. And we don't deprive the child from bearing the name of his father because perhaps they get married this way due to a shubha or a doubt. They were not informed 
Or somebody deceived them and said, oh, but there is an opinion, there is another opinion. So since there is another opinion, the punishment will be waived. And all the other related consequences will be suspended as well. But this is an illegitimate relationship that you should seize it right away. And you should be uh, honest with your parents and inform them. So if the father approves that and uh, uh, gives his consent to this marriage, that's fine. Or otherwise, right away, you should disconnect yourself completely from this man. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, we've got a question from Sister Dina. Uh, she says, I'm a convert living in the West. I divorced my husband, Muslim hus husband, and I have two children from that marriage. Um, he's not supporting the children financially. She yeah. says, is it permissible to get remarried and maintain custody of the children? Well, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a woman came to him once and said, Ya Rasulallah, in Nabni Hada, she pointed to a child that she was holding. In Nabni Hada, kana rahimi lahu wi'a. My womb was a container for him. And wahidri lahu, and my lap was a heaven for him. Wathadji lahu siqa. And my breast was a fountain for him. Mm -hmm. So basically, she's the one who bore him for nine months in her womb. She's the one she, who cuddled him and raised him uh, and put him in her lap. Her lap was like a heaven and a for him. Then she's the one who breastfeed him for at least two years, if we're talking about uh, the weaning age. Then his father came to take him away after we got divorced. So Nabi Wasallam said, no, you have more rights to him. We're talking about the custody after mm -hmm. divorce. As long as the child is young. And they differ really concerning the age, which after this age, the child custody will be transferred to the father. They said seven, they said eight, they said until the puberty age. And it differs from a girl to a boy because the girl needs to be more with her mother to learn more about the, the girl's issue and the women's issue more from the mother than the father, of course. In any case, so the mother would maintain the custody of the children until she gets married. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. So if she gets married, then the custody will be transferred to whom there is a difference of opinion. The majority of the scholars said it will be given to her mother, who is a child's grandmother. And uh, the opinion which I go with is the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, who said that if the mother gets married, then the custody will be transferred automatically to the father, who can take care of the children more than anybody else, since now his children should not live with a foster father, or somebody who is totally strange to them. He has more rights with his own children than this foster father, Jazakallah. or the stepfather. Jazakallah. Okay, we've got uh, two questions from Brother Adam. Um, he wants to know, when it comes to performing ghusl, um, should he perform a normal bath and then ghusl, or just do a ghusl and then a bath? Now, he's a bit confused. He wants to know what constitutes what here. What really counts for ghusl is what you do with the intention. So if you walk into the bathtub or the shower place with the intention of making ghusl, then you just wash your entire body. This is ghusl. So you get two in one. But some people differentiate and say, this is for ghusl and this is for wash. It's up to you. This is something extra. Mm -hmm. But if you stay under the shower for an hour without this intention of performing ghusl, that doesn't count as ghusl. If you swim for an hour, if you swim several miles, but without the intention of performing ghusl, this is not ghusl. Uh, if you dive, this is not ghusl. Only when it is accompanied by the intention of performing was, And we also said concerning performing wudu while performing was, We said the instructions of the perfect was is to begin by washing your hands, then your private, then perform wudu. Then wash your entire body simply by pouring the water on the right hand, uh, side first, then the left side, then all over your body. The third time, making sure that the water reached to the roots of the hair, and if you have a beard, okay, if a woman has braids, doesn't have to undo them. So if you do that, this is a perfect ghost. And the wudu has been done perfectly. 
because the ghusl lifts up the major janaba. So according, it lifts up the minor janaba as well. Your wudu is valid as long as you do not touch your private while you're drying up or you're getting out of the shower. You have done wudu. But if you're taking ghusl uh, as a shower or a mean of ghusl sunnah, for the Eid prayer or whatever, then you have to intend to make an independent wudu. The only ghusl which would be enough for the wudu as well is the ghusl which is required to lift up the major impurity. Um, following on from this question, the brother's asking uh, about the Friday ghusl. Okay, he says, uh, is this compulsory to make this ghusl on a Friday? Again? The Friday ghusl, is it compulsory? Uh, in the sound hadith, في صحيح الإمام البخاري the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said غسل الجمعة واجب على كل محتلم the literal meaning of this hadith which is a hadith that performing غسل is mandatory upon every person who reaches the احتلام age the puberty age but due to other references this ruling was diverted from being a must into mere sunnah mu'akkala so it's highly recommended for men who are going to attend salatul jumu'ah to perform ghusl it is sunnah mu'akkala it is not a wajib and Allah knows best as far as the best time for this if we're talking about ghuslul jumu'ah then it is related to Friday prayer not to the day rather it is only to the prayer that means I'm required to purify my body and to smell good and to look good upon going for Salatul Jum'ah. So I better postpone the ghusl until before going for the Salah. If I make ghusl before Fajr, this is the night that precedes Jum'ah, I'm required to perform another ghusl. If I'm talking about the preference to perform ghusl right after Fajr or an hour before going to Salatul Jum'ah, the best of course is the one which you postpone until uh, right before you go to the Salah so that you would smell good and appear nice. What about somebody who postponed ghusl to be performed after Salatul Jum'ah? Then that doesn't fit the ruling because the purpose of the ghusl is for the Jum'ah, not for the day itself. Sister Razina is calling from, sorry, she's speaking from Saudi Arabia here. She's writing this email. Um, she's asking about her name, and this is a name which is her husband's name actually. Her name is Rosina Abdurrahman. Uh, she says that my husband's called many names by the family, not Abdurrahman. He's sometimes called Rahman, sometimes Rahim. Uh, she says that after doing a bit of studies, I figured out that these are names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, well, how do I go about advising them if, for example, this is incorrect? First of all, Allah's names are in the definite format. Mm -hmm. So we say, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Qudus, the most, the infinite. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, for instance, in Surah At-Tawbah, Bil-Mu'minina ra'ufur rahim, that he was talking about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he is uh, forbearing and merciful, full of pity for the believers. Mm -hmm. So given this trait of being merciful to a human does not really contradict that Allah's beautiful name is Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim because you're not taking this trait and there is no comparison between Allah's trait as the most merciful or the compassionate and yours as Rahim. So if you say to somebody that he is kind, he is gentle, he is merciful, there is no problem with that. The problem is if you say Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim to other than Allah the Almighty, keeping in mind that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the sound hadith, the best names ever are Abdullah wa Abdul Rahman because it signifies our servitude and the divine nature of Allah the Almighty. So you say to yourself or to the person who is named with Abdullah or Abdul Rahman, he's the servant of Allah or the servant of the most merciful. Just a point here, the sister's name was um, she's Razina Abdurrahman. Now can you have a name, can you take your husband's name as the surname here, Sheikh, because it's linked here? Uh, this is a very important thing you brought up, 
Unfortunately, in the West, some people comply with the local uh, traditions. And once a woman gets married, she bears the name of her husband. Mm -hmm. That is prohibited in Islam. And if we're talking about women's rights, that I spoke to many women in the West, that they confiscate your rights. So Why true. shall you bear the name of somebody else other than your real father? So true, yeah. mm -hmm. So you should keep your name, the name of your family, the name of your father, the one who is responsible for your presence. And it is not optional though. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ud'uhum li aba'ihim wa aqsatu inda Allah. You must call them with their parents' names, with their father's names. And no woman should bear the name of her husband. In Islam, if someone carries the name other than the name of his father or her father, that's a bad sign that is due to an illegitimate birth of this person. But even the adopted children should bear the names of the real uh, fathers. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Got a question from Brother Saud from India. Now, he's asking a question related to fasting the Ayam al the 13th, or 14th, or 15th of each month. No. He says this is a very pious act. Um, he says, now, in India, we, we have a bit of a problem, he's saying. He says, uh, when it comes to Eid al-Adha, uh, some people, they celebrate three days after Eid, uh, all the way up to the 13th, 14th, uh, of Dhul Hijjah. He says, uh, if they're celebrating, how can they fast on these days? But in the beginning, uh, I just want to ask, uh, does it mean that you guys only celebrate uh, 13th in Ayam uh, al-Tashriq in India <laughs> or all over the Muslim world? Eid al-Adha, its days are the first day, which is the 10th. Then the following three days are known as Ayam al-Tashriq, and these are Eid days too, whether in India or in Saudi Arabia or in the States. Mm -hmm. So Muslims celebrate actually four days. And in these four days, it is prohibited to fast. The question is pretty smart. Because Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Awsani Khalili bi thalath. My best companion, referring to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa have enjoined on me three things, or advised me to commit myself to doing three things. He mentioned the three things which are as follows. To fast three days of every month. We're talking about 13th, 14th, and the 15th of the lunar calendar. To offer salat al-duha, past sunrise, every day, and not to sleep before making sure that you pray at Salat al -Witr. So basically, it is highly recommended, and there is a secret why three days, I said because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies their words of our good deeds. The minimum for each one hasana is ten folds. So if you fast one day, the word for it would be equivalent to fasting for ten days. Fasting three days of every lunar month, that means you receive the reward of fasting for the whole month. That's three times ten. Thirty equals thirty. And if you keep maintaining this habit on every single month, you shall receive the reward of fasting throughout the entire year. Now, since fasting three days, 13th, 14th, and 15th of every lunar calendar, or lunar month, is very virtuous and very great, what do we do on the month of Dhul Hijjah mm -hmm. when the Eid is extended until the 13th? The fourth day of Ayyamul Eid, the Eid days are on the 13th. You should not fast on that day. And by the way, perhaps that will make it easier for the viewers to understand when we say fasting three days, Al Ayyamul Bid, three wide days or nights. Uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th is not really a must. By the meaning, if somebody for a reason or another had to skip any of these days or all of them can fast any other three days. So the foremost on the top is to fast these three days. But if you skip them, you still can fast any other days. Fasting Monday and Thursday, then another Monday for the whole month would receive the same reward, uh, God willing. Only those who are performing Hajj, Hajj al tamat or Hajj al-Qur'an, which are obliged to offer Hajj to slaughter the sheep, 
per each pilgrim and they cannot afford it we said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ فِي الْحَجِّ وَسَبَعَةٍ إِذَا رَجَعْتُمْ تِلْكَ عَشَرَةٌ كَامِلَةٍ Meaning, uh, you can make it up by fasting for 10 days. Three, while you perform in Hajj, while you are in the course of performing Hajj. And seven, you can postpone them seven days when you return home. So he said, only those who have to fast the three days during Hajj are exempted from this prohibition. Fasting on the Eid day during Eid al-Fitr, which is only one day, or the four days of Eid al-Adha is prohibited. And only those who have to make up through fasting 10 days, instead of giving the Hajj, for instance, are exempted from this prohibition so they can fast on Ayyam al-Tashriq. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We're going to take a short break now, and inshallah we'll return in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ask Huda. This episode, as you know, we're going through your emails, so unfortunately, won't be able to take any of your calls. Uh, if you want to send an email, please send it to ask, ask at huda, H-U-D-A dot TV. Sheikh, we've got a question from Sister Hafsa from the United Arab Emirates. She's asking uh, about adoption in Islam, uh, the permissibility of it. Uh, what's the ruling concerning adoption, Sheikh? I really tend in the beginning of answering this question to explain that Islam encouraging, encourages taking care of the orphans, mm -hmm. raising them, sponsoring them, spending out of your money on them, feeding them from what you eat, to the point that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, the person who takes care of an orphan and sponsors him will be with me in paradise like these two and he pointed with the middle and the index finger indicating how near such person will be to the Prophet ﷺ in heaven. That is something which is highly recommended in Islam. The opposite is prohibited mm -hmm. which is devouring the wealth of the orphans or taking from their money or their share without uh, justification. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا وَسَيَصْلَوْنَ سَعِيرًا For those who devour, who consume, or take out of the wealth of the orphans without a just reason, only they're consuming not money. They're not taking from money. They're taking from the fire of hell. Then on the day of judgment, there is a blazing fire that's awaiting for them. So now we know the relationship between us and orphans. If we'd like to sponsor them, if we'd like to take care of them, raise them until they grow up, until they become independent, and so on. There is another thing which is Adopting by the meaning of having somebody move into my house, give him all the rights, such as my son or daughter, including giving him or her my last name. That is the only thing which is prohibited. Giving the adopted child your last name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and I think you asked me in the previous uh, segment, about a woman who is uh, named after her husband. That's right, yeah. Why did we say it's haram? Because of that. Allah stated that in Surah Al-Ahzab, You should call them after their father's names. So, given any adopted child, your last name is prohibited and is haram. What difference does it make? Some people might think uh, this is not an issue. No, it is an issue. Because when you happen to give the adopted child your last name, 
and you tend to treat him like your own biological son or daughter, and you confuse the issues. So he mm. grows up at home amongst your kids, thinking that they're all brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. blood-related, which is not true. And if it is a son, he, grows, he, he grew up at home, and he would treat your wife who raised him as his own mother, as his mahram, which is not true. So we have to understand that the adopted child, if he is not your mahram in a way or another, then he should be treated as a stranger when it comes to the issue of hijab and marriage mm -hmm. and also inheritance. Let me explain. A woman who has an adopted child at home, adopted boy, once the child reaches the puberty age, uh, she must keep the hijab on before him because she did not suckle him when he was uh, in the suckling age, nor is he uh, related to her in such a mahram way. The opposite is also true. If they adopted a girl and she reaches the puberty age, this man who raised her, who treated her like his own daughter, now is not a mahram for her. Because neither his wife nor his sister, for instance, suckled her. So she is totally stranger for him. Uh, if he wanted to marry to her, I'm suggesting. If he wanted, it is permissible. I'm not saying you have to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm saying if it is in his desire and she doesn't mind, that is permissible. Because there is no prohibition against that. So the issue of adoption is very sensitive when it comes to what kind of relationship between you and the adopted child. You adopt a child, you raise him or you raise her, either by moving them into your house or sponsoring them while they're being raised at their houses or in the orphanage, that's perfectly fine. And there is a great unlimited reward for that. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that one who wipes by his hand or taps on, with his hand on top of uh, the head or the hair of an orphan each single hair that his hand or his palm would touch, he would receive a reward for it. To that extent. But what's prohibited is giving them your last name, your own name. Uh, or considering them as blood related. So you should keep the barriers off. These are non mahrams. Some people are very smart to get out of this uh, confusion. Once they adopt a child, if his wife is one of those who can breastfeed the child, if he or she is still within the, the breastfeeding age, he lets her uh, feed him, breastfeed him or her five times. In this case, he can treat him like your own son, but due to suckling, or your own daughter due to suckling. And it will be prohibited for you to marry her when she grows up. And it's okay for your wife to take off the hijab uh, before this son because he's actually uh, a son due to suckling but remains another thing which is inheritance he does not inherit from you nor do you inherit him or her because they are not related I've got a question uh, from brother Muhammad Ibrahim uh, he says I want to know why drawing he said not to be accepted in Islam especially as Allah God gave us the talent for drawing and being allowed to do these kind of acts and sculptures and all the rest of it. He, he wants to know, is this something that Allah has given us and then taking away? I'm glad the uh, questioner mentioned in the beginning that it is Allah who gave us the talent to mm -hmm. do things, including drawing. I disagree with the way we present the question sometimes. Why is drawing haram? Mm -hmm. This is not true. Drawing is not haram. Only drawing life things, such as humans, or birds, or animals, is prohibited. And this prohibition is not the opinion of one or two scholars. This is something that the Prophet ﷺ stated in the very sound hadith. The highly sound hadith for Bukhari or Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَصْنَعُونَ هَذِهِ الصُّوَرِ يُعَذَّبُونَ بِهَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُقَالُ لَهُمْ أَحْيُوا مَا خَلَقْتُ The meaning of this hadith which is collected by Bukhari or Muslim, 
that those who imitate the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of live objects such as humans or birds or animals will be punished on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order them to breathe the soul into their drawings, into their carvings. And that's why the scholars really said it's best to avoid this. But if you're very talented, draw the nature, trees, uh, forests, rivers, seas, mountains, snow, whatever, you name it. But stay away from uh, drawing or carving the pictures of live objects, humans, animals, or birds. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Uh, the brother's asking uh, another question, and it's about the prophets. Now, he's asking something, making it uh, to be something which is a certain, which we need to look into. He says, it is said all prophets were white-skinned. Uh, thus, he says, how come none of them were black-skinned? Is this discrimination on our part? Uh, he actually phrased it in the passive that it was said, but we don't mm. know who said so. Mm -hmm. I remember once I was giving a lecture and the vast majority of the audience were Afro-Americans. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, uh, what was the ethnicity of Prophet Muhammad? So right away I understood that he wanted to hear that, oh, he was black or he was dark. Uh, the, not on this basis we determine who's good and who's bad. I would like first of all to quote the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqanakum min dhakarin wa untha وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Which means, O oh mankind, we have created you from a male and a female. Then we made you into nations and tribes. Verily, the most righteous one of you is the one who has more piety. Is the one who is more, the, mo the noblest one of you is the one who is more righteous. And the Prophet ﷺ made it very clear in his farewell speech that there is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab. Nor for a non-Arab over an Arab. For a black over a white, nor for a white over a black. Mm -hmm. Except through righteousness and piety. This is the only determining factor. Uh, Luqman, whom Allah revealed the whole surah in the Qur'an after his name, Luqman al-Hakim, the wise they mentioned that he was a black slave and his lips were very thick and his nose was very flat. It doesn't make any difference. Color, complexion, uh, skin color, height, sight, does not make any difference in determining the fate of the person. It does not even make any difference in determining whether this person is superior or inferior. In the sound hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ أَجْسَادِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَشَارَ بِيَدِهِ إِلَىٰ صَدْرِهِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah does not look, in the meaning of look here, He does not evaluate you through looking at your bodies, your colors, your complexion, nor your pictures, he only looks at your hearts to determine whether you are noble and righteous or not. So, uh, we should not even raise this question anymore after what we have heard from the verse of Surah Al-Hujurat and the sound hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. The brother's last question now is regarding a Muslim man who wants to marry a Christian woman, he says, uh, is this Christian woman allowed to practice her religion in the same house if they get married? If uh, a Muslim man happened to practice his right, which Allah made it permissible for him to marry a woman who is following uh, either one of the scriptures, Judaism or Christianity, it is permissible with the condition of al-ihsan that this woman has to be a chaste woman, not just a Jew or Christian, she has to be uh, also Muhsana, a modest and chaste woman. And he does not have the right from banding her for uh, uh, banding her from practicing her religion. So if she goes to the church on Sunday or celebrate her Eids and whatever in the church, that's permissible. But keeping the cross at home or practicing her worship uh, in front of the children and the household, that is not permissible. 
because the man is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the faith and the belief of his household. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it permissible for the man to marry to a woman from Ahlul Kitab, not the other way around. Not the other way around. You're responsible for protecting your family, your children. So if they see that, uh, they might be deceived and they might think this is a sign of approval. And as a matter of fact, I have seen that. And I have met boys and girls in some lectures and in camps who said that they carry Muslim names and say, uh, so why don't you pray? They say, well, my parents give me the choice. My dad is a Muslim, my mom is Christian, and that said, it's totally up to you. I don't want to force any of you. You make your own choice. So what happens is they are neither Muslims nor Christians. They are nothing. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. You will be responsible for that. You will be responsible for bringing a kafir to this life. For bringing somebody who disbelieves in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. So if she wants to practice her religion in the church, fine. But displaying the cross and displaying her acts of worship at home, no. Jazakal khashik. Okay, we've got a couple of questions from Brother Riyaz from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, his first one, he's asking about the term sabr or patience as it's known. He says that, I know this is an attribute of Muslims, and Muslims should have this, but uh, non-Muslims sometimes also have patience and sabr. Are they also rewarded for having this patience and sabr, Sheikh? For non-Muslims. First of all, as you just said, that it's a beautiful trait, and it's mainly the trait of the believers, because they understand that <coughs> Uh, after patience there is a great word mm -hmm. and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a word for patience which he does not give to any other act as a matter of fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran number one إنما يوفى الصابرون أجرهم بغير حساب one who endures with patience the calamities or enjoining what's right and forbidding what's evil or being patient for fulfilling what Allah commanded or abstaining from what Allah has prohibited shall receive their wages without limit this is an unlimited account. إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ And he said فِي صُرَةِ الْبَقَرَةِ وَبَشِّرْ الصَّابِرِينَ And give the glad tidings to الصَّابِرِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ uh, patience for calamities and dilemmas. When one endures it patiently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a magnificent reward, an unlimited account for this kind of reward. When a non-Muslim experiences a difficulty and a hardship and he endures it patiently, will he be rewarded for that in this life? Mm -hmm. Because patience is praiseworthy is praised by Allah and by his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us in another hadith that whenever the kafir, the disbeliever, does anything that's righteous, will be given its word in this life. أُطْعِمَ بِهَا طُعْمَةً فِي الدُّنْيَا And then, on the day of judgment, there is no reward. All their good deeds they have been rewarded for it in this life by giving them health, by giving them wealth, prosperity, success, children, whatever. But once the disbeliever dies in a state of disbelief, will not be receiving any further reward whatsoever. Because the great sin ever is shirk. And this is a sin which will never be forgiven. So his good deeds will not be looked at. Because he was compensated for in this life. While the believer, in the same hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, he shall receive a reward for it in this life and a compensation in addition to what Allah, the Almighty, preserves for him, with him, on the Day of Judgment, as far as the reward in Paradise. This is not only limited to patience. Any act which you consider it righteous, helping others, being generous, uh, being kind, a, a teacher who inspired <coughs> thousands of people, who taught them etiquette, whatever, 
if these people die in a state of kufr and disbelief, they have received their full wages in this life, and after that, they will be deprived even from Allah's mercy, because it will be only granted to the, to the believers. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, that He is only merciful on the Day of Judgment with the believers. Jazakallah, Sheikh for all your answers today. Well, that's all the time we have today on Ask Huda. Please, if you want to send an email, do send it to ask, A-S-K, at huda, H-U-D-A dot TV. Well, until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum.